This budget hearing conducted by the Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication now reconvenes discussions of the fiscal year 2018 executive budget request. This afternoon, we are meeting with the Guam Visitors Bureau to discuss their budget proposal. I want to preface this budget hearing as I have with all the other budget hearings with the uncertainty the government of Guam faces with regards to potential negative impacts to the general fund revenue collections and economic activity as a result of numerous factors such as the H-2B visa denials, potential federal tax reform cuts that may erode Gov Guam's revenue base and caps Section 30 uh, that we are collecting. With these issues at the top of the mind, our minds, the Guam Legislature has a daunting task of ensuring that we provide sufficient funding for public services the people of Guam want and need. Just as a brief overview from my colleagues and for the listening audience, the executive budget request submitted by the governor through the Bureau of Budget Management Research provides for 23.78 million or $150,000 increase for the Guam Visitors Bureau from 2017 authorized levels of 22.3. This is a 6.6 .6 increase as compared to the 2017 authorized level. The Guam Visitors Bureau comes before us today with their FY budget with 18 requests of 27.8 million, which is nearly 5.5 million or 25% increase over the FY authorized level of 22 million and um, almost 5.3 million more than what uh, was in the executive budget request. In as much as you've all been sworn in by the Sergeant at Arms, um, Mr. Chairman or Mr. Tonight, uh, you're welcome to begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Hafade, Speaker Cruz and honorable senators. The Guam Business Bureau, GBB, is pleased to submit its budget request for fiscal year 2018. On behalf of our board of directors, management staff, our request not only takes into account the success of industry over the last several years, but the concerns and the challenges we see on the horizon. First of all, I'd like to recognize my board of director presence here. Um, board Director Bill Noll, Board Director Montemesa, Board Director Sam Shinora, Board Director Mrs. Hong, and Board Director Mayor Hoffman. Tourism only works when the entire community comes together to support our visitors industry. Guam has been experiencing record-breaking arrivals because of the support from the entire island, including the legislature, governor, the lieutenant governor, mayors, government agency, plus the private sector and stakeholders like airlines, hotel, optional tours, transportation companies, restaurants, and many, many more. You can see many partners who took the time out their busy today schedule to come here today to support GBB budget requests. I would like to thank them and the over 20,000 tourism industry employees for all their hard work and dedication. So I'd like to take this moment and give a round of applause to them and for everyone in this room for making tourism work for Guam. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. With more visitors being welcome to Guam, the Tourist Attraction Fund, TAF, has also seen exponential increase. This is one of many direct performance indicators of how well the tourism industry and GBB are doing. We now have the opportunity to make this meaningful investment in ensuring our industry continues growing. Over the last several years, Guam has been experiencing decreasing arrivals, of course, from Japan. Because of the decrease of airline services, increased competition from Taos, Asia, Okinawa, and Hawaii. The weakening of Japanese yen making Guam a more expensive destination. 
JBB has been making major changes in our Japan business, and I feel confident that we will be able to turn around. However, it is crucial that we receive the resource needed to support our effort to attract more air service. Demand is there, but we need to attract the supply. We have the opposition situation in Korea with five carriers and soon to be six. We need to drive demand to fill the supply of seat or we will lose some air service. Meaningful investment to Guam tourism product has not been seen in nearly two decades. Improvement, maintenance to infrastructure throughout Tumon and the island's historical sites will be a long way to attracting repeat visits. If not, we will continue to see one and done visitors because we don't meet expectations. For the last three years, GBB has been given a role over budget and we did the best what we had to increase economic activities on Guam. In order to maintain these record arrival numbers, it is very crucial that GBB be provided the requested resource. We have the proven track record to deliver results, and GBB success means more jobs, a better quality of life, and maybe most important to the legislator, more tax revenues to the government. We appreciate the continuous support you have given to the tourism industry and to GBB. The success we experienced today is not due to one person or agency, but together we make Guam a better place to live, work, and visit. Thank you very much. This is Jesus Mas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if okay with you, I'd like to have a short PowerPoint presentation to kind of go through the details of uh, GBB's budget. So how important is tourism to Guam? So every several, every couple years, GBB um, hires an economist to do a tourism impact study. So the last study was completed in 2015, fiscal year, and the previous one before that was 2010. So I'd just like to highlight some of the numbers from the updated study. So you can see in FY 2010, about 150 million in government revenue was provided by tourism. In 2015, fiscal year, we had 245, or almost 100 million dollars increase in the revenues to the government. Uh, you can, uh, tourism economy sales rose almost 300,000 from 1.4 billion in sales to 1.7. And the last line, we increased almost 2,000 jobs from 18,404 jobs, or 31.5% of all jobs on Guam, to 20, more than 20,300 jobs, or 33% of all jobs in Guam. Guam, one in three jobs now is tourism related. We have a short video to demonstrate this. Why is tourism Guam's number one industry? Tourism benefits our economy. Visitors come to our shores to experience our island. More tourist spending means more dollars flowing into our economy. Tourism creates jobs. From bell service to front desk to tour agents, more jobs mean more opportunity. Tourism builds businesses. From hotels to shops to restaurants, more businesses mean more dreams come true. Tourism preserves our culture. In the visitor industry, culture takes center stage. Celebrating our culture means keeping our traditions alive. Tourism keeps our land and waters clean. It all lights up. Tourism improves our quality of life. It helps make Guam a better place to live, work, and visit. Tourism works for Guam. So Tourism 2020 was our strategic plan, which we all launched together in January of 2014 with our eight core objectives. I like, I'm happy to say we're on track for most of these objectives. I think the, the speaker mentioned uh, number three is to add more hotel rooms. Uh, we do have the Tsubaki Tower that will be opening up in 2019, but other than that, we do not have any more uh, hotel 
construction going on, mainly due to the H2 visa problem. So we foresee that as being a constraint on our ability to grow hotel rooms. But on most of the other um, initiatives, we're right on track. I'd like to mention some of Guam's successes when it comes to new airlines and routes. We pretty much have every Korean low-cost carrier flying to Guam minus one. So we currently have five airlines flying from Korea. We also opened up two new cities in Korea, Busan and Daegu. We also, with United, opened up direct service to Shanghai. In that time, also, we have uh, Cebu Pacific adding a third carrier flying from Manila. And we had HK Express launch in December. They have suspended their service starting in June, but we're working with them to start flying to Guam. So we've added a lot of new air service to Guam, but we need to continue to focus in this area, as I'll explain more. As far as hotel successes, you know, tourism is really an amazing industry. You can see here when the Dusitani Guam Resort opened, that provided 450 new jobs to the people of Guam. Tsubaki Tower will provide about 400 new jobs when that opens. So, you know, what other, in what other industry is providing this kind of employment for the people of Guam? Um, Gary Hiles, I think, just came out with his latest uh, um, economic uh, DOL report on jobs. And in the last five years, hotels added over 1,400 jobs to the economy. GDD, while we're primarily focused on marketing, has become uh, more and more uh, focused also on product development, as that is key uh, to marketing as well. So we have uh, taken on the Tumon Street Library Rehabilitation Program. So we thank the legislator f legislation legislators for supporting our request for those funds and we were finally able to finish this program. It'll be done by September. Um, all the lights will be repaired, the wiring, plus we will be moving to energy efficient LED lighting that is much brighter and has a much nicer light. Uh, so the speaker can look forward to having lights in front of his condo. Uh, Tumon bus shelters, uh, we will also be done with this project in September. Uh, so currently right now our visitors wait in the rain and sun. Of course, Guam is a family market, so it was always disheartening to see uh, ch children's in strollers, young, young women and children getting drenched or uh, by the rain. So we're happy to have this important uh, infrastructure. GBB has also been focusing on major events. I'll just highlight two right now. We did take over the finances at the request of the OPA of the Festival of Pacific Arts. And I thank my team for taking on that extra duty. Um, and it was quite a successful event. We also hosted last year the PADA Annual Summit and the United Nations World Tourism Organization Ministerial Debate. So two major global events hosted on Guam, really highlighting our profile as an international destination for major events. And I'd like to share some of the awards that GBB has uh, won this past year. I'd like to highlight uh, the top picture there. You see our Deputy General Manager along with our Director of Marketing Tony and Pilar, together with our congresswoman, and to the left is Wilbur Ross, the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. So GBB this year was awarded the highest honor from the U.S. government, the U.S. Department of Commerce Presidential E Award, recognizing outstanding performance in exports. Of course, tourism, we often don't remember that tourism is an export. Foreign, foreign nationals are coming to the U.S. and buying our products and services, which is an export. They just happen to do it in the U.S. So we're very honored to win this very prestigious award and continue uh, to elevate the profile of the Guam Visitors Bureau, but more importantly, the island of Guam. We also there in the bottom right, it's kind of small, we also have the two year, for the past two years been awarded the best agency by the readers of PDN, the PICA Award, so we're very happy with that. And you can see the many awards we win overseas at the different trade shows we attend. Many of these awards are, of course, for our wonderful cultural performances, as well as our presentation at the events. We do a lot of research at GVB and we'll be releasing the results of the 2017, we call it the STAR survey, but it's a survey of tourism attitudes of residents. So this survey we do uh, around every five, five years. We're a bit late this, this year to come out with it. Um, but one of the questions we asked the community is, well, would you say GVB is doing in promoting tourism on Guam? So almost eight out of the 10 of those surveyed, 78% stated they thought GVB was doing either very well or somewhat well in promoting Guam tourism 
and you can see the increase there from 2010 from 40 percent to 78 percent. I'd like to now focus on Guam's success as far as arrivals. Um, you can see there the number of arrivals in 2015, which was a record year, was 1.37 million arrivals. 2016, we had another record, one point, built the 1.5 million arrivals mark for the first time in our history. And this year, we're on track to uh, continue to grow at 1.5, about 5.5, 5.6 million arrivals. Our projection for next year is 1.58 million arrivals. Um, of course, this is determinant on the amount of support we get um, as far as resources. And I'll get more into detail on this. What we're noticing as we grow our arrivals and we get more and more arrivals, we need more and more resources to support that level of arrivals. And to continue to grow that arrivals takes even more resources. And you, as the chairman mentioned, you could see our performance really measured by the Tourist Attraction Fund. So you could see, which is really made up of two components, the uh, occupancy of our hotel rooms and then the rates that our hotel rooms are charging. So you can see in FY 2010, we were just about 21 million in, uh, in tourist attraction fund collections. Uh, this FY 17, we're on track to hit almost 43 million, so pretty more than doubling the tourist attract fun, uh, attraction fund revenues. So on the next slide, we have GVB's FY 2018 budget request. We have the last um, three years, fiscal years, plus this year's fiscal year request. So for 2018, as the speaker mentioned, we're asking for 27.8 million. Uh, last year, we were just at 22.3 million, which was pretty much a rollover from the year previous and uh, a million more than two years previous. And I wanted to go into more detail on the components of our budget request for this year. So the tourist attraction fund percentage of appropriations, if you look at the total TAF at the level of 43.5 million, you can see GBB is asking for not all, but just 64% of total tourist attraction fund collections. Um, in the previous past budgets, we are roughly getting around 60%, so that's in line with what we have been previously receiving as a percentage of the total TAF. Next slide, I'll start with our largest uh, department, which is marketing. You can see for the marketing, GBB is asking for 17.8 million. The last three years have been pretty much a rollover budget of about 14.5 million for marketing uh, in all the different markets plus our digital platforms. And we always tout, of course, record arrivals, which is great. We're always trying to increase our arrival numbers. But I'd also like to share this chart. It's a little bit small up there, but uh, I'll explain it real quick. We also want to look at visitor expenditures. So not just raising arrivals, which is great, but we want to make sure that um, the visitors are spending and, and the total expenditure on Guam is growing. So you can see 2014, 2015, and 2016, um, we have Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and mainland China. So for Japan, you could see uh, visitor arrivals have been down. And in the middle chart, you could see in 2015, we were down versus 2014. But we had a slight increase in 2016 because of increased expenditures from Japan. So although the arrival number was down, we were slight, slightly increasing because of increased spending. On the, on the other side, Korea has been up and up. But you can see, still see in the total, Japan, as far as visitors' expenditures, uh, is, the, is the highest uh, spending market for Guam and providing the most sales. But Korea is definitely trending up and becoming a real solid number two market for the island. So we're pleased to uh, have that development. And also interesting, uh, we have Taiwan and China. So these are the four markets we do uh, visitor, uh, we, we track visitor spending with our survey. So you can see China, uh, Taiwan, although it has more arrivals in China, the China is a higher spending market. So in total, the China uh, visitors are spending more, or it's about even to Taiwan. Now, obviously we're getting the question about Japan arrivals and why are Japan arrivals down versus Korea. It all starts with air seat capacity. So unless people start swimming to Guam, they're going to come here th by through air. And you can see in Japan versus 2010, uh, we had 1.3 million seats from Japan. 
now we have less than a million seats. So that will always be your inventory or your, uh, your capacity. On the flip side from Korea, we've gone from 170,000 seats to over 640,000 seats in the market. And that should be growing again this year while Japan is still continuing to slide a bit. And you can see the growth in Philippines and Hong Kong in seats as well. So uh, it's, it's something that we're definitely focused on getting more seats in the Japan market. And then that's why we definitely have to support the Korean market because we have much more air seat capacity. And what that leads to as well is pricing. So without enough supply in the market, so if everyone can remember their economics, uh, less supply will lead to higher prices. So you can see the average fare in 2016 uh, one way from Japan is about $350. Uh, Korea is less than 250 So round trip, you're talking $700 from Japan. Korea, you're talking $400, $450. So you can see that, that at a higher price, you'll have less quantity. And this is really reflected, reflected in the arrival, I mean, in, in the average package price from Japan. So one of the goals of 2020, of course, was to increase our quality and yield, which we have done in Japan. So no longer do we have the $300 package to Guam with air and hotel. But on the flip side, you know, our prices have gone substantially to the Japanese consumer, which are mainly families and also, also office ladies who are uh, maybe constrained. If a, uh, so you can see here in 2010, the average package price in yen to Japan was about 70,000 yen. We just say call it a 700 bucks. Uh, you can see this past year, now the average package price is over 1,000. So you're talking about a family of four um, paying 700 for four people, now they're paying $4,000. So you know, a 40% increase in a short amount of time. So the market is adjusting to Guam as a higher price destination. I, I don't have any slide up here right now, but on the flip side, Hawaii, Hawaii's price has been actually coming down because they have more air seats and more supply. So Guam and Hawaii are becoming very competitive as far as price. And in the consumer's mind, you know, Guam is a three-hour destination and always been kind of a, a value budget destination. So we're dealing with that in Japan and trying to change the image of Guam. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these marketing points, but one, one program that really helped us this year to stem the decrease in Japan has been uh, charter flight air support. So we're actually helping travel agents charter flights to Guam. So this past year, uh, with our direct support and working with the travel agents, we were able to support over 40,000 charter flights to Guam. Uh, so to put that in perspective, the year before we had 100 charter flights. This year we're going to have about 250. So that additional seats is very critical for us in this time when we don't have enough capacity, especially in the peak times in March and August. So next year, uh, a big part of our Japan budget will be to support new air service through charter programs, but also now we're also talking to new airlines. So we mentioned in Korea we have uh, five different airlines and maybe a six coming. In Japan, we have one Japanese carrier flying once a day. So we're, we're trying to meet with all the airlines, incentivize them to fly to Guam, and we'll be able to support them through this additional money. I, I also just want to mention in Japan, we are changing up the way we're doing business as well. All our advertising, we have switched from, on, uh, from you know, uh, mainstream media and we're doing everything online. So we're being very, uh, uh, which is nice because we get to measure all of the results of the advertising. We can even measure what creative is doing well. People like this commercial because they're viewing it more and clicking it more versus this commercial. After they view our ad, they're going to this travel agent. So it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a dramatic shift from what we've been doing in the past. So we feel confident that with additional supply and with the changes in our marketing strategy, we'll be able to turn everything around. For Korea, we need more budget to support five Korean carriers. Kamsamida, thank you. Uh, Korean arrivals are up 12.6% for next year if we can do this and we can get close to 700,000 Korean arrivals. So currently right now, Guam is the number one uh, for Korean arrivals to the entire United States. So, but with this additional um, amount of capacity, we have to be more active. We have to promote and work with our partners. And now we have to start doing more advertising and promotion of Guam. I, I, I don't want to go through each one of the other markets, but I would say the similarity between China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Philippines is air seats. So from China, we only have twice, daily ser uh, twice weekly service on Shanghai. So you want to increase that to increase arrivals. 
Same with Taiwan. So Taiwan, we did lose Eva Air this past year. Um, so we only have one carrier, China Airlines, but they're flying four times a week. So we want to incentivize them and work with their travel agents so we can boost that to daily service. Hong Kong, as I mentioned, Hong Kong Express, we pretty much doubled our arrivals from Hong Kong this year, but without Hong Kong Express, now we're going to be back where we were in the beginning. So we want to work with them and uh, also work with United on doing more promotions out of Hong, Kong's, Hong Kong. And the same goes to, uh, to speak about the Philippines. We were able to double arrivals from the Philippines with Cyber Pacific coming in the market, as well as United and Philippine Airlines. If we don't support Cebu Pacific, uh, we'll be back where we started with. Everyone still with me? Okay, I'll just check in. On the, on the digital side, I wanted to just highlight a few highlights from uh, what we're doing digitally. Digitally, we have the um, Shop Guam campaign, so we have that app, and we had uh, over 30,000 downloads this year. Um, also, on the social media front, uh, we were up 25% in uh, FY16 versus 15, uh, with over 350,000 total followers to our GBV websites. Uh, we're also continuing this past year to really focus on Instagram as that's a growing platform for travel. Uh, we, you know, also with the new uh, expanded budget, we'd be able to pursue other niche markets. I just want to highlight one is um, we are working to promote uh, uh, the LGBT market, which is a new niche market. And we recently uh, attended the IGLTA, International Gay and Lesbian Travel Association. We became a member. And here they are, they promoted on their uh, social media our Pride Pacific events, that which just happened and GBB supported this past uh, week. So it's an expanding market. Of course, Asia is a little bit behind the US, but there is opportunity. We have reached out to um, the partners IGLTA in Japan, and we'd like to, uh, we have the resources to continue to attract these niche markets. Under, under the GBV marketing, we also do a lot with branding. So what falls under branding is our Year of Love promotion. So that's our, our, year, our yearly campaign, which we've been promoting. Last year was only on Guam. And i just like to highlight our Half a Day Pledge here, which kind of features, which is also under branding, but also featuring our Year of Love. We did an event at uh, Fort Soledad, uh, um, really honoring um, Big John and all the, uh, and his carabas and all the work he did to really uh, really perpetuate what the Hoffa Day spirit is all about by, sh by dedicating his life to uh, showing his, our culture with our visitors you know, at a historic site. So we're happy to have his family there, as well as the mayor and, and, and Dom Sangil, who also helps keep our island clean, with our local artist from Guam, Josh Agerstrand, who did this portrait on these hearts. So that'll be up there for everyone to see. We also have on the right one of our partners. Uh, you can see Pilar there at uh, uh, Sea Walker taking the Hoffa Day Pledge underwater. And in the bottom left was, uh, this was the United Airlines Guam Marathon, a really successful event, but you can see love on display. This gentleman won the race and then proposed to his, um, to his fiance there on the stage. So that was really nice to see. Research, research is really important in everything we do at GVP. We try to make all our decisions based on good information and research. Um, I'd just like to highlight one the money we're asking for is the same as last year, but I'd like to highlight one project that I'm really excited about is the customs form. So you can see on the right, everyone's familiar with our eight and a half by 11 customs form. We've been working with Guam Customs to make the form basically half the size and then update all the information as well as the survey. So that's a project that we'll be rolling out uh, next year. Sports and events. So GBB has been putting a lot of efforts in sports and events to, especially in put signature events in the slow period. I just mentioned the marathon. You know, this past April, we had 122,000 visit arrivals. April before was the slowest month of the year. We used to be happy with 100,000 arrivals, so we smashed that record. And I think a big part of that was the uh, United Airlines Guam Marathon. And so we continue to put all these events, uh, the Guam Micronesia Island Fair, which moved down here to Organia and extended to five days. Uh, Guam Live, we have the Guam Barbecue Block Party coming up into the slow time which is really April through mid-July. And now you can see the results with record months in slow periods. So I know um, Chairman is happy and the hotels are happy with the, the increase in uh, occupancy during the slow time. But for next year, we're asking for an increase in sports and events as we would like to continue uh, to improve and support our signature events. We'd like to see if we can um, uh, throw one more signature event 
And also, I'd like to point out, these are all the, the next slide would be all the uh, sports tourism funded grants that we give to different organizations on Guam, as well as GDB sponsored events that we do for uh, different um, com community mem uh, members to help them increase and develop their events. We just have a few pictures of our signature events, but I'll go to the next slide. GDP culture and heritage. Um, two years ago, we had 800,000. This past year, we had 750,000. This year, we're asking for 900,000. The increase would be mainly for, uh, we're going to be having the 30th anniversary of the Guam Micronesia Island Fair. And we'd also like to expand some of our grants for cultural arts programs and communi community development grants. So on the next slide, you could see the many, many, you can't even read it, many, many events. You know, the first one there is the, the Malesso Crab Festival, all the way down to um, our Valley of the Ladi Festival that we support and everything in between. And I'd like to just quickly share one of the programs that's near and dear to my heart is the Guam Tomorrow Dance Academy. So these are, this is, now we now have two gumas in Japan uh, that are helping us promote. So this is at the Osaka Travel Fair. So these are all Japanese singing and dancing in Chamorro. <laughs> next slide we have uh, what's very important especially now with all the news uh, we're reading in the, in, the, in the paper daily is the visitor safety and satisfaction so quite a large increase we're going from about 900,000 which we received this year to 1.4 million and I'd just like to share some of the reasons one is to support and expand our visitor safety officer program um, I'll go into that in a little bit detail more water beach safety uh, we also want to launch our visitor industry professional program which is online uh, training for our community for free and also uh, expand our concierge program so we have the Korean concierge program which was uh, authorized by the legislature so we'd like to expand that, expand that for all markets. So the, the visitor safety officer program I think has been a really great success and I'd like to share some of the numbers from that so they, uh, they do two things they do concierge services uh, so there's traffic assistance, giving directions, taking photos, community feedback, and they also do safety and security services. I didn't list numerous things that they do under that section, but you can see there, since they started two and a half years ago, they've al almost done 30,000 different, helped 30,000 different visitors um, with, with traffic assistance, directions, photos, and so forth. And they've responded to almost 3,000 safety and security issues. And the top one I'd like to focus on, half of those have been homeless issues. Um, so they're doing a good job of really helping us. Chima now has so many homeless people that are really causing a lot of problems. So I really thank our VSOs for all the work they do. Um, you can see here, maybe illustrated better than stats, you can see them picking up trash there at the beach, taking pictures there. I think he was a monk from Thailand. Uh, and then I like to focus, I think uh, uh, Joe Cruz is here with us today, but in the paper two weeks ago, there was a... Uh, a Japanese visitor that was push, push, her purse was snatched. You can see her in, her in the bottom left picture and Joe was able to apprehend the, um, the suspect and the VSOs were able to find the purse and all the belongings in the jungle. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> the, the other program I'd like to point out is the Korean concierge program. So I really hate to talk about this, but we had another incident where someone was, uh, a woman and her daughter were held, held up at gunpoint at Two Lovers Point, um, you know, our iconic visitor site. So when we heard the news of this, we, our Korean concierge service, we had them reach out to the family. I'd like to thank Fisheye for donating 
uh, an optional tour to see their show. Uh, GBB, my staff, personally helped, helped um, you know, give the family some, some assistance, uh, along with Justin there from our Korean concierge program. And then Justin will also become the power of attorney to help prosecute and interpret for this case. So I think a real win, you know, a real, real tangible result from this program. So I'd like to also give uh, Justin and the, the program a round of applause as well. Thank you. I can't stress how important it is when these incidents happen to our visitors. If we don't respond today with social media, uh, this, this, these, these things can really blow up and really ruin our brand reputation. So I think these efforts are really, really helping us. Destination man maintenance. So you can see uh, quite an increase here from what we received last year. But to be quite honest, the million point zero eighty five that we received last year was not enough to even uh, do what we were doing the previous year. So something I didn't know that GBB did when I joined the Bureau was island road maintenance. So we actually cut the grass and pick up the trash and all the major routes. Um, last year we did not, with the budget constraints that we had, we had to cut about 12 out of the 16 routes we normally did. So the increase here would help us to put back those routes and keep our island clean. And at the same time, deal with the other issue that we're seeing is beach, mainten beach uh, maintenance. Uh, you know, we pick up the trash daily, but it's not enough. We need more work to, um, to deal with all the, the debris at the beach. Let me just share with you, the next one is a map of the routes we cover. So basically, we were able to maintain Marine Drive and the southern routes, but we had to cut out most of the routes we do in the central part of the island. So we'd like to bring those back, as I mentioned. And then next slide, I'd like to just focus on some of the issues we do with, deal with. And this is all down in Tumon, so you can see top left. I know Gun Beach is a hot issue now. This car was actually, about a year ago, burnt at Gun Beach and left at the beach. So we have to deal with cleaning, with that, cleaning that up. And then these are other dump sites that we had to work with um, uh, different community partners to clean up as well. I'd like to just play a short video about some of the work we do for the destination. Tourism, it's Guam's number one industry. And if you look around, you'll see how it's working for all of us. The money we make from tourism goes into projects that keep our island beautiful. From all our major roadways to our village streets, from our historic parks, to our pools and beaches. Tourism works. Tourism works. Tourism works. Tourism works for me. Brought to you by GVB. Sidzuris Maasi for making Guam the best place to live, work, and visit. Okay, I'm going to wrap up soon. Three more slides, I promise. Okay, up next, um, okay, last but not least, of course, administration. Uh, GVB received our seventh consecutive clean audit. So you can be assured that every dollar that we receive, uh, we've been uh, very responsible with in, in, as far as reporting and administering. Um, the increase in administration is just for annual uh, in increases to pay increments and employee benefits. And um, on the next slide, we have a graph showing, so as a percentage of our total budget, only 11% goes to personnel costs and 3% goes to other administration costs. So I think we're very um, putting uh, most of the money that we receive into actual programs, advertising, um, and, and other, other things that we do and not into administration. So I think we're very efficient in that way. And uh, before I end, I just want to share with you, we did hand out our annual report. Uh, so Josh Tekenko is not here, a PIO, but he did a fantastic job compiling this with our research department and all our different departments. So we're very proud of it. All the photos were from uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Manny Crisosimo from FESPAC. So please take a look. There's a lot of good research data information and all the more detailed activities what the Bureau is doing. So th thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Senators. That will conclude my presentation. Sidious Masi. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Knight. Your biggest increase is a $3.7 million increase in contractual services. And I thought I understood how you guys were doing the contracts. 
Um, I thought I remembered last year you wanted to increase the Japan contract so that we could try to salvage the Japan market. When I look at the, the breakdown that you have, there's a very small increase for the Japan contract. Am I reading that correctly? 154,000? Uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker, are you in the... In contractual services. Yeah. Is the Japan contract only going up uh, 154,000? Yeah, so a, a, big, a big part of what we're trying to do in Japan is, is one is the contractual services would be for like advertising uh, with our uh, t with our advertising agency as well as some of the work with our office does. But also what I tr we're trying to do is have more programs together with key stakeholders such as uh, airlines and, and so forth. So we're also trying to budget some money to help with our airline support uh, programs. And like what are you talking about with the airline support programs? Are, are you giving incentives to the airlines for the uh, seats? Yeah, exactly. So we're working with travel agents. So for example, for a travel agent to charter a flight to come to Guam, they would pay approximately $100,000, so quite a big risk on their part because they would guarantee the entire flight. So we're helping them with marketing the flight so that they can be successful in selling the flight. So for example, uh, it depends. We would offer maybe three, three to four thousand, three to five thousand dollars to that travel agent to help with marketing the flight. That's on top. Of that's an increase from its from the 7.5 that the lady was getting. Is that correct? Yeah. So b basically, the increase in the Japan marketing budget, uh, we received 7.5 this year, and we asked for 8.5. That million dollars would be used for air service development. So that's either supporting charter flights, and or regular service flights. Korea got a 1.8. Not that I'm opposed to it. My two pointees yeah. <laughs> were to address the Korea market. And so that substantial increase in the Korea mar uh, contract, what's that for? I think everyone's uh, maybe tired of hearing me talk. Maybe I'll let the, the chairman and your appointee answer that question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, for, for years, first of all, we're, we're opening Pusan as a Pusan office. So we're no longer just basing all of our operations in Seoul. We're removing a base of operations to Busan. So that's, that's a portion of it. Uh, for years, we've been very fortunate in, in Korea being a very cost-effective destination that's grown over the period of five years from 150,000 to almost 600,000. It's no longer a backup market. It's no longer a, uh, a tertiary market. It's a primary market. And in order to keep it moving, and we don't want to rely upon good fortune, but rather spend money wisely to support the continued growth from this point forward, it's going to be a bit more challenging. So now that we have 600,000 visitors, we need to put a little bit more money in the, uh, in the market to make sure that it continues. There are a why bunch of why programs. Would need to, why would it need, uh, be, be more challenging? Because there's more competition for the Korea market worldwide. Korea is a, is a market that every destination wants. And with the advent of the LCCs, which have benefited Guam dramatically, have also benefited all of our competition. So to keep, we, we can no longer afford, it's one thing if you have 150,000 visitors and you lose half of them, it's a problem, but it's not a big problem. But when you have 600,000 and it's your, it's your main market along with Japan, you can't afford to lose anything. And so we have to ramp up our activities dramatically in Korea to keep that level going. It's a very high level, 600,000 visitors, and the, and the island needs that support uh, from that market. We're quite nervous about the future of the Japan market for a whole host of reasons. And so the, uh, the success of the Korean market becomes that much more, that much more uh, essential. And so that's why we're stepping up in addition to just doing more. We're trying to work with the airlines to keep them engaged. 
We have new seats coming in September from at least one LCC, quite possibly another one after that. Some of them are, are going to be on the wrong end of it or might be more interested in another destination. So we want to keep the marketing engine going strong to make sure that there's a lot of interest in Guam on an ongoing basis. We can't afford for Korea to fall down. Korea is what's really keeping us afloat. I understand. Yeah. Well, and that, and that, that's and the that reason. was the reason why yeah. you got my nomination, in spite of the fact that you, the two of you will probably come back in two weeks and oppose my, salary, my uh, minimum wage increase, which I'm hoping you won't. That's, that's the topic for another hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I promised everyone because, that I wouldn't bring it up. If you're, if you're talking, <laughs> you guys are, are showing how much everybody's making. Yeah. And the fact that there are 200, I mean, 20 some thousand people there that are working. But yes. They're Imagine not, how many there would be if there hadn't been a minimum wage increase. <laughs> oh. Maybe 40,000. Yeah, it's slave labor. Maybe. Yeah, I Maybe. suppose. As I could. said, that's, that's a topic for another hearing. I, I think, again, I'm, I just, think, I'm just saying yeah. that it is, it's patently unfair for everybody else to be making money except the ones that are actually doing the work for us to keep those places clean and working. We've got to do something to assist them. But anyway, uh, that, as you put it, that's for another hearing. Yes. But I'm just saying, I understand the Korea market, yes. which are, the, how important the Korea market was, which is the reason why my two of my three were for the Korea market specifically. And I'm just, when the budget was flat, you still managed to, to go up almost exponentially. I'm just wondering, for the investment, dollar for dollar, is, 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 is the return going to be as great? No, uh, no. No, but the, the increase from 150000 to 600,000 has been remarkable and, a, and an, an incredible return. There's no way to continue to, to uh, have the same types of returns. You know, Walmart adding 1,000 stores doesn't quite generate the same return as when it was half the size as it, as it grew. So, so the returns, no, they're not the same as what they were, but still substantial relative to the other markets and relative to the potential impact. Still substantial and very positive. No, I, I like it up at the six, seven, and eight that you're trying to get to. But I'm just saying, was there a need for a, a $1.8 million increase to that contract and to open up a completely separate office when it was without the separate office and without the additional two million you did as well as you did yeah I, I my my uh, the, the answer that comes to mind is uh, the beginning of the LCC phenomenon in Korea is what jump-started the growth in Korean arrivals so when we only had Korean air you know historically we were stuck in the 150,000 to 180,000 range for 15 years. Uh, and what got us out of that range was the, the opening, the, the creation of these LCCs that as they began doing business, because they know Guam, seized upon Guam immediately as a great destination for LCCs. So we've been very successful in accommodating the opening for Jin Air, Jeju Air, Tiway, Air Pusan, now we hope Air Seoul, maybe East Star. Well, the same is true for all of those other destinations. We're not the only destination that's four hours away. And so now that the LCCs are, are up and running and doing pretty well, now they can begin to look to other destinations. So whether it's, you know, the Philippines has become a very popular destination for, for Korean visitors for a whole host of reasons, much more, uh, a much more value-oriented 
uh, vacation, then the vacation experience, then the vacation in Guam. And so as we move forward, what we're seeing from the LCCs is that they're being pulled away to other destinations. And in order to keep, keep us humming at 600,000 plus, we've got to continue to invest into the market. We're not, we're not, uh, um, we're not just a, the new thing for an LCC anymore. We're one more competing destination. They have a very short memory in terms of who helped them get started. And so no, I was, I was your oversight chair ten years ago when we went to the May goes first yep. LCC yep. meeting. Yes. So I understand that. I'm just wondering about the investment in in other places. Uh, we lost. Did we lose Hong Kong Express last year? We we will. Yeah, we will. Yeah. yeah. Or is it this coming month? Yeah. Why was that? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, with Hong Kong Express, uh, to my understanding, was the demand was good, so load factor was 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 reasonable. But Guam is becoming a more expensive destination, and so you know the Hong Kong market is very competitive. They have a lot of options between from Hong Kong to, South, like I mentioned, Southeast Asia. So now we're competing against destinations: Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, that Bart mentioned, plus Korea and Taiwan, but also Japan. You know, Japan has, they set their 2020 arrivals target at 20 million. Uh, 2015, they broke that number already. So they revised their 2020 arrival number to 40 million. So they want to have 40 million visitors uh, in 2020. It looks like they're going to hit it. So that means Japan is pouring a lot of money into Okinawa, similar destination to Guam, also to places like Sapporo and throughout Japan. And so w what's happening is like for Hong Kong Express, because Guam now is a more expensive destination, they were finding that the, although the air, the air ticket was quite low, the, you know, the accommodations were quite, quite much higher than they would find like in uh, Vietnam or other Southeast Asian destinations. Uh, so that was their, the rate was, the yield was not high enough to sustain the flights. But we are continuing to dialogue with them, trying to see how we can support them. They do also fly to Saipan and they said if we had visa waiver, because they also funnel visitors from the uh, southern China, Guangzhou, uh, you know, that also helps fill up the plane because they can easily access Hong Kong. So that was another decision why they kept Saipan and did not continue to fly to Guam because of uh, the visa issue. But they were a great carrier, as I mentioned, and so if we can be more active in the market, like Korea, we have the supply, but now we need to drive the demand or else those planes aren't filled up and then they stop service. I mean, it's as simple as that. Mr. Speaker, if I might, there, there's another issue in the Korea market. As we, if we compare it to Japan and we look at our repeat visitors, about, uh, you know, of our Japanese visitors, 41% or so uh, are repeaters. Clearly, there's something they really love about Guam and they want to keep coming back. In Korea, that percentage is below 20%. That's a challenge. That's a challenge, and that means that, that we can't survive on what we're doing now. We have to continue to go out there and find new customers on an ongoing basis, which is always more expensive. And so some of that we can, we're, we're trying to address through the experience. And so you've seen somewhat of an increase in the more experiential part of, of the vacation experience on island. But from a, from a purely marketing standpoint, it's always more expensive to find new visitors, new customers, instead of getting those repeaters to come back again and again. And that's one of the challenges of this market. There's another large expense, miscellaneous expenses. It went from 1.1 to 3.1. .3 in, in which um, section, sir? Miscellaneous. Under administration or which section of the budget? I imagine that's oh, sorry. whatever went from 1.1 to 3.1. Oh, I'm sorry, on the, in the uh, total sheet. Yeah, the red page?
summary, sir, you're saying their, their miscellaneous expense has, has increased? Um, yeah, the total, uh, at least from my office, it says that it went up from 1.1 to 2.1. I'm sorry, we, so we, we would have to go through each each department to get you an answer for that. We can provide that, that answer okay. and, and go through it one by one. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, sorry, each, each budget section would have miscellaneous, and so we can go through and, and Submit us a real complete explanation of all the different the differences from last year. Okay. I was looking at your some of the your co your contractual costs. You have a payroll preparation service. I'm sorry. One more time. Sir. You utilize a payroll preparation service. <coughs> yes, we do. Do you not have an accounting division? That's just the processing of the checks. Yeah, we have an accounting division. And it's not large enough to do a payroll for your... Yeah, we have 36 employees, so... The, the accounting still submits all the documents. They just process the payments. And your global website, you want to describe that to us? Yeah, so four, I think it's going on four years ago. Before, we would have each office develop the, their website by, you know, so Japan would develop a website and Korea. And what we found is we were not delivering the Guam brand in a very cohesive, so if you went to the Korea site, it looked totally different from the Japan site. So we work, we put out the RFP and the winning company was SimpleView which is the world's, which specializes in destination websites. But it's more than the website. They provide, of course, the website, but they also provide the CRM, the customer relationship management back end of the site, which we use to uh, track all our members, uh, deliver messages to the members, and also track all the uh, activities such as sales activities or uh, group activities. So that, that's the complete plan. And so they, it was quite a big undertaking because we have to translate each website into, you know, so we're talking about six different languages, so um, we're quite, I think, quite happy with uh, the system. Uh, it is, you know, it is used by all the major destinations, so it provides all the features we need. We still need to develop the usage on the CRM side. I, we're not using all the tools that, that are available to us, but we are getting better in util utilizing the website, and it has been. Um, the good thing that they also provide is the search engine optimization. So when you search for Guam, our website is always coming up at the top, you know, whether that's you're in Korea or Japan or Guam or uh, in the English um, site. Your audit. Yes, sir. You mentioned it was a clean audit. There was a management letter where it had, there was a statement, agent services and fees exceeding agreed amounts were invoiced to GVB. The underlying contract contained no provisions for this eventuality, and therefore the manner in which final resolution occurred may not be predicated on the underlying agreement. Um, what were those agent contracts, and how much was that? And, and how did we pay it when the auditor said that it didn't look like the contract itself had provisions for it, or w was it paid? Yes, uh, so I think that was for, for the Guam Live event. We did, uh, I think, make a payment of, a, I think it was about, it wasn't a material amount, but it was mentioned in the audit, so we did take a look at it, and uh, so we're going to rectify that situation moving forward. Was that the only one? Yeah, that was the, the one, one men mentioned in the audit. In some of your sports and um, special events, do you guys make a count of how many off-islanders come? Like I understand that a lot come for the United um, Marathon and the Coco Race, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering how many how many visitors come in for like the Guam Live and for some of the other things? 
Yeah, so the, the, the kind of, if it's a free event, like the Guam Micronesia Island Fair, quite hard to track the exact number of visitors coming for the, that event, but an event like the Marathon or Guam Live, we do our best to track whether it's a visitor or not. So, um, with Guam Live, it can be tough because if they're you know, buying a ticket, it's hard to see where they're coming from, but we do try to either work with our travel agent partners that are selling it or give codes to those people that are coming. So we do, we do try to track to the best of our abilities how many visitors are coming to the individual events. So for example, like barbecue block party is a free event. So there's, you know, we kind of roughly do a count and see how many visitors there are but it, it's, it can be kind of difficult to track the exact numbers. Unless it's a paid event, then we have more opportunity to do that. Also for the grant applic application, so we do have events like Smoking Wheels and many other events. The Coco's Crossing we just had in Marito. Um, in the grant application, we do ask them to provide the information of how many Afalin visitors they are expecting, and then they do a post report where they report on what they achieved. I'll let your oversight chairman ask some questions and let me go through and take that without having to talk. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. And thank you to all the GBB employees and the stakeholders for really taking us um, to the level that, that we're at right now. Um, I, I just have a few a few questions. Um, you know, the and I, I appreciate your, um, your presentation about why we have to um, increase the amount for the Korea market and that it really doesn't translate into um, uh, perhaps more, um, as, as much more than we want on a dollar for dollar. So I understand that uh, explanation, um, even though I do appreciate the, you know, what um, um, concern, um, at least on the surface, you know, on, on that. But on the Japan market, that's where I, um, I, I have a personal concern of, is that, um, for many years, we've been spending a, a huge amount uh, for the for the Japan market, and rightly so. You know, it's been our number one market, and we need to ensure that we um, that we preserve and increase this. <coughs> However, I don't I don't be, I don't see how um, I'm not you know the explanation that I've I've heard so far doesn't really it doesn't I don't I can't comprehend um, how uh, a million dollar increase, which is the which is the request now would only translate into keeping us into status quo um, because 700,000 is what you're looking at bringing in for the Japan market. And so you know, perhaps at least even for the, um, the senators who, who are the first term here can understand what type of system, what, you know, what, um, what are we doing in the Japan market? What are we doing in the Korea market and the other markets that are working? And you know what are the differences? What can we do differently than, you know, besides just changing the way we um, we advertise? First of all, let me explain that um, Japanese mind has changed from the years that we knew that they were traveling. Now they have choices, meaning the low cost carrier are giving choices for these people to travel where they want at discount price. So within the Japan, they are busy traveling to discover Japan itself. So they're flying, flying low-cost carrier within internally. And ASEAN country is their target now for the Japanese to go. So a lot of the low-cost carrier are pushing these people to go to ASEAN country. To that means Da Nang, Vietnam, Cambodia, Malaysia. Right now, to go to Malaysia, $300 round trip with hotel with the government pushing plus the Singapore Airlines I'm sorry the Singapore is 300 bucks that means there's the, con the country themselves are helping the business bureau to fund the way to go to their country same with the Korean okay we're happy with the numbers right now but now all this low cost carrier have to keep on moving or flying or if not they're gonna start losing money that's the uh, business model. They have to keep flying. That means they have to have a choice where should they should be going. So I remember three years ago in Da Nang, there were a very small crowd of Koreans. Now there's a lot, a lot of Koreans. And also to Cambodia. So they are looking for new destination. And, and so that means we have to, tourism is a very fragile, delicate product. 
and we have to make sure that these people are aware that Guam is still here and that to keep the interest up. And that's why, like Director Bart said, it's very important that we keep this market on the radar screen. If not, they're going to fly over us. And because all other countries are always looking for them to come. And always LCC are looking for new destination. We just went to a conference on LCCs, like um, Nathan and I say. All the LCCs from Koreans are now heading toward Japan. And, then, and because what's happening is we need to keep this thing going, it's, it's also like Korea is troubled right now because the Chinese are not coming in, right, because of that fat issue too. So it's a very fragile market that we have to make sure that our product is where it is. And for the Japanese too, like Director Bart said, the repeat market is there. And but we cannot just be happy with the repeat market. We have to keep on developing product. We're trying to sell Guam, and we don't have a thing to sell in Guam right now. That means we have to keep on producing new stuff. We have to maintain what we got. We got to keep going and, and, and make sure that we keep the interest of the Japanese to fly. But earlier we have mentioned Jap uh, Hawaii is now increasing their flights to Hawaii. And Delta is flying, Japan Airlines have daily flights that more than us. So we are trying to create our, the target is right now is to increase seats from Japan. Okay, when if the seats is a simple math, if there's more seats, the price will come down. And when the price comes down, the people will take that at that price and will start traveling to Guam. So Japan, right now we have to put the seat back again. That means we need more seats to go on. And, and then, then, then what's going to happen is the airlines will start using their marketing strategy to sell their seats. So right now, what's happening is um, Japan Airlines is increasing one more flight to Kona. Okay, that means Japan Airlines is spending more money again on their own bucks because they want to sell their Kona flight. Here, we need the airlines to start spending their bucks also. But what comes first, the egg or the chicken, right? So what is GVB doing, and at least for fiscal year 2018, specifically to get more seats? Yeah, uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and that kind of also leads me to answer the speaker's previous question about the miscellaneous. Uh, so the large increase in the miscellaneous was because of, uh, because of Japan and this airline incentive, uh, airline development incentives that we're offering. So th as I mentioned, this past year, uh, the board approved uh, to do a charter airline incentive program, so that's to stimulate charters. But we also, uh, the board also approved um, regular service incentive program. So we would provide, because there's the the issue that um, uh, Chairman Morinaga brought up is very true. So you can look at Korea. We have five Korean carriers flying to Guam. Uh, look at Japan. How many Japanese airlines are flying to Guam? We have one flying once a day. So you can see the disparity there. We thank United Airlines for providing city, uh, six cities from Japan, but uh, they are a full service carrier and they are you know, a higher, providing a higher level service and a higher price from Japan, whereas uh, opposed to Korea, we have the phenomenon of the low cost carrier. So you can see the next question is why don't we just get some Japanese LCCs to come to Guam? So that's the future vision. We just attended a, a conference uh, LCC conference and what are we doing? Uh, chairman and myself and our Japan office have been very aggressively pursuing more airline service from Japan. So we're meeting with all the different carriers. Um, some of the new Japanese LCCs are Vanilla Airlines, Peach Airlines, there's Skymark. There's, um, it's, it's funny, the first LCC that we had fly from Japan is actually a Korean LCC, T-Way. And they fly from Daegu to Osaka and then to Guam. So I always tease the Japanese LCCs, if you don't want to fly, the, someone else will. But then the problem is, you know, why, why don't they just start up right away? So number one, the Japanese low-cost carriers are not as advanced as the Korean ones. LCC model was kind of late to come to Japan, and so we just have now the Japanese LCCs starting up in Japan. But they're focused on domestic, so flying within Japan. So there's Jetstar as well, flying from Japan. There, there's a whole slew of them. The other thing is, as I mentioned, Japan inbound. Japan is very focused on inbound. 
So Guam is not offering any people coming to Japan. So an LCC like Peach Airlines is focusing on all those Koreans and Taiwanese wanting to go to Japan and shop and, and, and buy things. So that's, the, that's one hurdle that we're also, also overcoming. And then the last is the regulations in Japan. So why don't, why don't an LCCs come to Guam? They would have to get approved by the FAA. They have to invest in a, a safety system called ETOPS. Then they have to get approved by the Japan Aviation Board. So all this takes quite a long time to have um, to go through that process. But we have been meeting with all the uh, Japanese carriers. And as I mentioned, the, the case is very good. You know, Guam is a known, I'm very confident Guam has a good brand reputation in Japan. Every J Japanese person knows Guam, probably more than our own US citizens know Guam. Um, you know, they've, we had a long experience with Japan. Uh, the flight cost right now, it's $700. If you're an LCC, you're looking at that and hey, that's a good yield for a flight, a three and a half hour flight from Japan. So I think we have the business case there. So now we have to go through the hurdles, the regulatory hurdles, uh, help those airlines, show them that they can be successful flying to Guam and then help them overcome the, the, the issues. And what we've been doing is laying the groundwork. So meeting with all those airlines and we're also meeting with the Japanese government. So we had a meeting with the Japan uh, Aviation Bureau to talk about how can we, uh, how can you help us overcome these challenges on the regulatory side to have these Japanese airlines flying to Guam. So I think it, it's a matter of just continuing to work together, but you can see the model in Korea, it's not, it's not secret. More airlines, more supply will mean more visitors, less supply will mean less visitors. So I'm very confident, and that's why we did ask for this extra money in Japan is to support uh, this new service. Obviously, when you start up an airline, the investment cost is going to be very significant, right? So low-cost carriers are all about keeping the cost low, so they're looking at the bottom line. So I mentioned Hong Kong Express. We got them to start. If they don't start generating a profit, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll leave. But I think in Guam, we make a very case, good case from Japan with that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, demand and rates. Uh, I think it's also important to remember that Japan is, a, is an expensive market. It's an expensive place, but it's very stable. And we, we're in the, the, the infrastructure of the island is at this point still somewhat uh, Japan oriented. And so we need to continue to support that. I mean, I, I don't believe that Guam can be successful without a very strong, vibrant Japan market, which has its challenges as it is an aging, it's an aging market. Uh, our outbound is declining. Competition is increasing. So even though it's, ex it's a little more expensive to do business and it's a little less efficient dollar for dollar than some of our other markets, it's, it's essential that we stay committed to the Japan market. It's what made Guam successful and it's what continues to be the basis of our tourism industry. I've been in the Korea market, working in the Korea market for 25 years. It's a great market, but it's also a volatile market. The Japan market is not volatile. It's very stable. And so at the end of the day, if there's one group that you can count on coming year after year, day after day, it's the Japan market. Korea market has done phenomenal things over the last several years, and, and we're going to invest in the market so that, that continues. But at the end of the day, you know, our bread and butter really comes from the Japan side still. And until such time as that changes, we really need to uh, dedicate substantial resources to, to make that happen. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and Senators. Uh, my name is Monty Mason. I'm the Vice Chair for Guam Visitors Bureau. Uh, to add and elaborate a little bit on what the Chairman has said, as well as uh, President uh, Nate, and to the um, uh, comments that were just shared by uh, Chairman of Korea Marketing, uh, Mr. Jackson. I'd like to also point out, in addition to why uh, we need to continue our uh, aggressive efforts in Japan is, one, we know already, and it's, it's, it's noted here in the seat capacity, that we're looking to sustain 972,000 seats. It's very simple, in my mind, and in the way that we should continue to market in Japan is, really, we're selling 972 seats to sustain that and have these airlines continue to keep those flights coming. We've, they've showed already that there is a decline in the seat capacity. 
yes, there's reasons for that. But we need to look at it in the other perspective, that we need to invest and work with the current airlines to include United, Japan Airlines, Delta, that every seat that they are dedicating to Guam today out of all the six cities in Japan, we need to protect that. We cannot lose any more seats. I agree with the chairman that the long-term or the mid-term strategy is to get and work with low-cost carriers. If we can even get to that point, there is an opportunity to do that. That is a little longer-term uh, strategy. But in the meantime, I think you are correct that, yes, it seems like we've been doing several things the same way in Japan. That's not happening today. In, in Nate's presentation, today, it's business unusual. We need to look at Japan in a different way than we've been in the past. That is happening today with you know, the Japan Marketing Committee. There is a, 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 a renewal of urgency. You may not be seeing it you know, uh, being acted out, but it is in, there's work behind the scenes and in the committees and in the subcommittees that are looking at this very closely. It's a simple business. It's about selling seats to Guam. That's what we need to do, and that's what we need to make sure that we can sustain that. We cannot afford to lose any more capacity out of Japan. It's as simple as that. And in order to do that, we need to commit the investment so that these current airlines today who are supporting Guam will have a better confidence in our efforts and we just need to spend that money wisely. There is a different strategy for 2018 in terms of really focusing on the six cities that we have today. There's two opportunities, one from the city of uh, Sapporo and two, the city of Sendai. We only have two or three flights a week out of these two cities. The other four cities, we have daily flights. Our opportunity here is the current airlines that we're servicing Guam today, we want to work with them and potentially increase those from two to three to four weeks a day. That will definitely grow arrivals out of Japan. This is a strategy that we really need to invest in and work with the current airlines who are committed. We, our whole strategy is to increase the profitability for all businesses, to include the airlines, the hotels, and every other optional tour and, 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 and people in the industry. We're not doing this to lose money, and we're not doing this, we're not planning to fail. We are planning to succeed. This is the strategy, and this is why we're looking and asking and requesting that the investment that is being presented today by GVB is to be supported. I can have the same confidence that the president has as well as the chairman that providing this particular investment, I am confident that we will succeed in Japan in turning it around. It is today, you know, I am, I'm, 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 I myself am not satisfied with it. But okay, I'm stepping you. up because I believe that everybody working together, it will happen. We have that consistency in our industry that that's where we're most resilient is when we're down, everybody gets together and push to lift everybody up. And this is what is happening. You may not see it you know, on the surface, but there is that sense in the industry. And that's why they're here today because of for that reason. Thank you very much. And I, and I, I, uh, I agree with you. I agree with all the statements about the importance of the Japan market, right? But um, as, as you were saying that we are actively ensuring that we keep the air capacity, the seats that we have now, what is the reason for the reduction of those seats? Is it because there's not, th that the demand is, is not there? That's why we have to push and ensure we market Guam and get more people to come? I mean, what's, what's the reason for, for that? My observations, and I've uh, been in this business for the last 30 years, and I see that, again, as stated, it's a primary market for Guam. 
we have the support of the Japanese people for the last 40 years, consistently through thick and thin. But we need to also embrace that relationship and tighten that relationship because it's an honor, it's a privilege to do business with them. And to the people of Japan, we honor their commitment. Yeah. And when no, we get I think, that commitment, I, think I saw a slide earlier, Nate, that you um, presented where the seat capacity has has decreased from Japan. So, you know, wh that's that's the question. Yeah, I there's kind of. I mean, I can't, there's not just one. I'll give you the shortest, co most complete answer. Number one, most of our air service from Japan is U.S. carriers. So you're talking about United Delta. Remember when the yen was when I started, it was 75 yen to the dollar. It's gotten as high as uh, almost 130 to the dollar. So you're talking about if they sold exactly what they did last year, you're down 20 percent. That's why I mentioned with the yen exchange, it's very hard for the US carriers, right, to they report in US dollars. So now that you're the yen's at 110, 120, you're reporting back to Chicago, Atlanta, hey, we're down twenty percent in Japan. Why? Well, just because of the yen. So that, that's the number one reason. Uh, number two is I mean we, like as I mentioned, Japan has been focusing on inbound. So what that means is uh, you know the main cities we you know Narita, Osaka but all the other secondary cities in Japan, there's 48 airports in Japan, are trying to attract these low-cost carriers and other carriers from Asia So for inbound. But what that means is that flight from Peach, from Taiwan, is leaving Japan, so there's all the seats going the other way. So now Japanese, when they used to look for a resort destination you know, 30 years ago, um, uh, you, know, you had Hawaii, Saipan, and Guam you know, as your options. You know, now you have a slew of destinations that are available, so the competition is stiffer as well, and um, you know that makes it tough for full-service carriers. But and the other thing is, uh, some of the carriers. So Guam traditionally has been a lot of the flights receiving were night flights. So someone would fly a day flight to another destination, then at night you could fly from Narita to Guam, three-hour flight, come back, and still do the other flight. Well. As I mentioned, the Japanese consumer has so many more choices now for day flights. So if you're with your family and you have the kids and the stroller and Guam's a family market, okay, uh, do you want to arrive at 2 a.m. in the morning and take the night flight? You, a lot of times you prefer the day flight. So we're noticing the trend of the day flights to Guam are doing better than the night flights. So some of the airlines, like a Korean Airlines that pulled out of Osaka, their night flight would have to be really discounted to uh, get the um, kind of load factor that they could do. But that's why I think uh, uh, definitely the demand, I think, is there. You know, Guam is very strong. We're very good with families. Uh, as I mentioned with the office ladies, they, they, they love Guam. It's just that the cost is maybe out of, their, out of their range. I did show you the chart with, you know, we've gone from 70,000 yen, so 700 bucks to 1,000. So that's, that's, that's a good thing, right? We want to raise the quality of our destination. We want our partners, the airlines, the hotels, our optional tours to uh, be making profits so that the investment makes sense. So, but the key is we do need to, uh, as, as uh, Chairman Mesa said, uh, help our existing carriers be successful. So we're working very closely with United, Delta, and T-Way, and then also attract uh, new carriers to help uh, stimulate the market as well. And as I mentioned, so the price of Guam, package price of Guam is going up, and Hawaii, so we have the advent now of the low-cost LCC. So now there's low-cost carriers flying not just short-haul destinations, but flying long-haul, like Air Asia X is flying now from Malaysia to Japan, Osaka, and then now flying to Hawaii and offering rates at like 200 bucks. So, but I think overall we can, uh, we met with all the airlines. The business case, as I mentioned, is very good. And uh, if we keep working with them, seeing how they can be successful, use our investment to support our existing partners so we don't lose additional seats, I think we'll be, uh, we have the opportunity to be very successful. And I kind of put it this way, you know, Guam is three, four hours, that's the key, right, with visa waiver. So the countries that we have options are Japan, Korea, Taiwan, within that, that area. There's no other source market, I mean, without Japan, what other source market are we looking at getting that will replace Japan? You know, China, well, we don't have visa waiver for China, so it's very difficult to grow compared to Saipan. So I think it's so important that now we have two legs with Korea and Japan. We have a more diversified uh, tourism source market than we've ever had in our history. It used to be 90% Japanese and 10% everything else. So now we have a kind of a very even split. So I think we just need to solidify Japan, 
um, support Korea, and I think we have a very good uh, tourism industry, as you can see from the performance. So, of course, we want to see Japan turn around, and we have to because what other option do we have? Is there another source market out there that we can, you know, look at Saipan? They're less than 50,000 Japanese. You know, they're really reliant on just China at over 200,000 and Korea. But you know, if something happens with China and they lose the visa waiver, where, where would their tourism industry That's be? That's right. So, just one last question about the Japan market: Has GBB looked at the? Um uh, the arrangement you have with your other markets, where they're on a on a GSA, uh, because I believe for for Japan, is it just um, you have your it's a GBB office, right? Um, that's what we've been using, and you know the the thought there is that when you have these GSAs, just like you've done in Korea and, and the other markets, you kind of get um, you kind of get them working harder because their their return is based on what they deliver, right? So is that something has GBB um, looked at? For the Japan market, is that something viable that you see uh, moving uh, moving forward? Uh, it's something that we've, we've we've discussed. Obviously, we're very happy. You know, we think our Japan office they work very hard. You know, many of them have been there 20 years, and they work diligently for the people of Guam. Um, so I wouldn't say it's a matter of them not working hard. You know, it's it's just it's a e economic yeah, forces. Yeah, and, and please, I I, yeah. I don't want my my question to be construed that I'm saying yeah. they're not working hard. I, I don't. I'm I'm just saying is has GVB looked at this uh, arrangement, and is that something that uh, if you looked at it, is it something viable? Yeah, and it, uh, and I, I didn't take it to mean that way, Senator. I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, but uh, but there is advantages to you know having it uh, outsourced. You know, G GVB is very good at outsourcing. We've had success in other markets through the outsourcing model. So it's something we've discussed that. Uh, not intensively or intensively studied, but it has been mentioned, and it is something I think we should uh, discuss internally with our Japan, with our chairman and our Japan marketing committee. And so maybe you want to chime in. Okay. One of the thing regarding GSA is there's pro and con. Um, in Japan, is re like Monte Me Director Mesa said, it's all relationship. GSA is more like a contract, right? You create a relationship today. In two years, we might not extend that GSA contract. So the, that other stakeholders, the JTB or whoever, the agent or the other stakeholders, the consumer, will doubt if we're going to keep the promise. If us being there all these years, we keep our word. Right? We say one thing, we'll continue to keep that word to keep on doing business. But GSA, sometimes we will change. Right? And uh, if you keep on changing, the policy changes, the relationship might change. It's a trust might change. So why am I creating this trust for two years, not knowing that you might be around third year? So that's one of the disadvantages. But us being there is something that people feel comfortable that we're there. Okay, Hawaii is a different story because Hawaii is a state. They got a lot of fun. They got they will continue whatever they've been doing. But even that too, they are downsizing Japan market. They're going for outside. They have U.S. market or whatever. And going back to little, the question about why Japan losing, like the President Nathan said, Japan market now is inbound. That means having inbound, they had to create their product. All these long haul areas in Japan that nobody used to visit, now the foreigners are going to visit. That means they are improving their product. They are making it nicer, easy access, either by bullet train or by their the domestic airline flying in there, make it easy access. That means the local Japanese who live there has lo easy access too. So that means they have a choice again. Stay in Japan, not to apply for passport or come to Guam. But luckily we're three and a half hours here. So that is one of our advantages. Three and a half hours, that means the family, the people old like me can travel. Not <laughs> don't have to sit on that small chair or whatever. But this last trip from Korea, there were 15 people, one family, from the grandfather to auntie, uncle, to children, all in the business class. So there is always a people who travel a full service carrier. And people who want to just a quick getaway with low cost will come to LCC, but always will people will fly on a full service carrier. So there's a choice. So we have to create a best choice. So things for people in Japan so they can come affordable or they want to come a full cost 
full service carrier and the United Delta Japan Airlines are full service carrier and they was they have their loyalty so they'll still come but anyway that's my okay. thank you case. thank you very Thanks. much and so uh, my, my final question is uh, the tourist attraction fund is is um, funded through the hotel occupancy right and I know uh, we, we've talked about this but I want to put it on record and for my other colleagues to also understand where perhaps the committee is going uh, is moving forward um, you have your, your research department there, and I know I don't know if you've ever, if you have taken a look at, you know, if you look at tourism, um, it's not just the hotel. Um, you have um, all, all different industries. You have rental cars, you have bus, um, you know, and all the other um, industries that relate to tourism. Is that something that you've, um, a GVB maybe now or in the past has taken a look at, and then looking at how do we, um, um, you know, perhaps grow the tourist attraction fund uh, because it's very good now, and I and I credit um, GVB and the stakeholders for bringing us where we're at. As I said earlier in my opening uh, statement, but is that something that you've taken a look at as GVB to look at how the other um, components of of tourism can somehow you know perhaps um, directly or indirectly um, to to be able to able to be able to contribute to this. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, most, from what I've known in my knowledge, most destinations do the bed tax. It's the, the common way to uh, do the hotel occupancy tax is a common way to do it. Uh, other, other ways, um, you know, commonly that's used mainly for marketing the destination. It is the tourist attraction fund. We have been, you know, using more and more funds for uh, local projects, capital improvement projects from the tourist attraction fund. Uh, some, some to spread it a little bit more fairly, and not just put it on the hotel. Uh, we did, we have talked about business improvement districts. Like, so Waikiki has a business improvement district. How that works is a certain area of economic development. The all the stakeholders in that area pay something uh, into kind of a pot that goes into, you know, it's a common area fee. So that's a model that that's been used. Um, so I mean, that's another another option as far as kind of spreading it out to, you know, because. Like you said, there's not just hotels in Tumon. There's other businesses that we cut the grass for, but they're not really directly paying for that service. But you know, at the end of the day, the hotel occupancy tax is a value-added tax. So it is the consumer that's paying paying the tax. Not really. I mean, I, I'm sure the hotel will say they're paying it, but it is it is added to the to the bill separately, like a sales tax, right? Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a, that's another option. Is some kind of business improvement district, which we have uh, we have. Uh, discussed. Okay, if you can, you know, look at that further, because there's a lot of talk from um, a lot of different um, um, stakeholders are coming forward, and there's a lot of competing interests for different projects, right? Um, we look at the hospital, we hear people say, well, let's put a departure tax. Uh, we look at the environmentalists and say we need to um, preserve our environment. Let's, um, let's, let's, let's put together a resort tax. And so before we entertain those kind of, of things, I think um, it's, it's, it's important for maybe GVB to start looking at this um, and, and you know, kind of thinking outside of what, of what we're doing now and then recommend to us you know, what is the proper uh, way to move forward on this. But thank you very much, and thank you again to all the GVB um, employees. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate that, Senator, and thank you for mentioning that to us. We'll, I'll work with my board and team to uh, perhaps have some options and uh, best practices and some research uh, on that area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just Masi, to everyone here, um, I just want to give a big kudos to the team at GVB and all the stakeholders who are here for your dedication and your hard work um, every single day to make sure that Guam is the best place to live, work, and visit. Um, a couple of my questions um, have to deal with destination maintenance as outlined in your budget. So. The destination management and capital improvement projects in our tourist districts are really important for not just visitor safety and satisfaction, but also to make sure that our local families can enjoy um, a lot of the work that you guys put forward. GVB has budgeted $2 million for these projects for this fiscal year. Can you just give me an overview of the $2 million and what, what that would go towards? Sure, sure. Absolutely, Senator. Um, the $2 million uh, that goes into uh, Tumon hardscape maintenance, so we maintain all of the landscaping in Tumon plus, oh, I'm sorry, the hardscape would be things like um, crosswalk repairs,
painting the curbs, the, those repairs to the hardscape. And then we also do the landscape maintenance as well throughout Suman. As I mentioned, we do the island roadway maintenance, so we're cleaning the major routes around the entire island. Uh, we also do Tuman and Haganya beach cleaning, so we rake the beach and pick up the trash in Tuman and Haganya. Uh, we do have a, a, a contract administrator that makes sure that all these contracts are being fulfilled. Um, and then the one I mentioned that we wanted to add, uh, the board had uh, the board meeting uh, talked about it and discussed. We are seeing so much trash and so much complaints from locals and visitors. And by the way, everything we do here is, we always say is as much for the local community as it is for our visitors, is to um, allocate 300,000 for Tumon and Hanaganya Bay trash cleanup and pickup. And then the last item is we do holiday illumination. So that includes a Christmas display village um, uh, right next to the uh, speaker's condo. And we also do along the road um, we do. We wanted to add. We haven't been doing because of lack of budget. Uh, a lighting display along Tumon Road, uh, along the the Tumon Simitoris Road. Um, part of that because we didn't have street lights, so it didn't make sense to have Christmas lights with no street light. But we'll be done with our uh, street light project, and then we can do that as well. Thanks. I actually want um, a little bit more information about items number two and number six. So that's island roadway maintenance, and you mentioned the Tumon and Hagatnya Bay trash projects. So um, I just wanted to see if you are already working in conjunction with the mayors and with DPW, who have been tasked with um, some of these issues as well. I just wanted to see if you have met with them. I know you yeah. have a mayor on your board. Yeah, so these are the major road maintenance. I think the mayors are focused uh, within the village, and then we do the, the main roads and grass cutting. Uh, as far as DPW, you know, the advent of this contract is that before, before my time, there was a, a joint contract, half GBB, half DPW. At a certain point, we would pay the contractor, and then the other half wouldn't get paid, so we ended up just taking on the whole thing. But I have to, to their credit, this year, because I mentioned we did not get the full budget request, so we had to cut all the kind of central routes out of this road maintenance and DPW did uh, and the mayors did step up to pick on to pick up those routes even as far as the d director of DPW going out and bush cutting route 16 himself you know so uh, you know we understand that they are uh, resource constraints on that side but we, we try to do what we can to support and you know try to work together with everyone just to get the job done and you know okay that, thank that's you our, that's that. our strategy yeah as the oversight chair for Gita, I have heard um, the Gita board, and I know um, Monty serves on both, I've heard them express concern over the investment in LCCs over airlines that have a home base here and investments that really deepen and strengthen our economy and our local workforce. And I don't want to beat a dead horse. I know we've um, kind of discussed that earlier in earlier questions, but I'm just curious about how we can balance our grape and airlifts with incentives for LCCs while also acknowledging our other carriers who have been on Guam for decades, who employ local workforce, and contribute to our tax base. I think, I think that's a fantastic point that you make and something that we definitely uh, appreciate that you bring that up. As far as GBB and uh, mentioned by uh, Chairman and Vice Chairman, um, we're really, you know, United brings about a thousand jobs, and these are good jobs on Guam, you know, the kind of jobs that uh, mechanics, pilots, you know, people making you know, substantial, you know, more than minimum wage. So these are great jobs and we don't want to lose any of those jobs. And we have to remember they are our hometown carrier, right? They have, they're the only airline based here on Guam. And so the taxes that they pay or that, you know, the payroll taxes all stay here. So it's absolutely essential that we support United and, and all the, the management and employees. And so how we do that is we're, you know, they are our hometown carrier. So at all our different markets, we try to work where we have flights with United, especially Japan, also Hong Kong, Philippines. We try to work very, our offices work very closely with United in those markets. We try to support them. Like we mentioned, our Japan budget, a lot of our budget is co-ops together with United uh, promotions. You know, we just celebrated 30 years of direct service from Fukuoka uh, last, uh, just this past week. And so we were together with them um, and we're doing some PR around this big anniversary. So yeah, great point. We have to support our hometown carrier. I mean, they, they've been here, you know, Continental Air Mike and now United, and they're really investing into our island. And um, I, I would suggest from this body, 
if there is something, it's above my pay grade, but if, if there's something you could do to uh, incentivize or support them, you know, with, with GITA, um, I think that's something that I suggested to, to the GITA board, that if we can help them. Uh, you know, one of the things we're finding out is the fuel cost, just like it's expensive for us going to the gas station to buy fuel, it's also very expensive to fuel up their aerp airplane, and these guys are based here, meaning they're buying all the fuel here, which puts them at a disadvantage when you want to say, oh, the price to United is high. Well, you know, if you're buying expensive fuel, that's a big cost to the airline. So things like that, I don't know if there's tax incentives to them or tax incentives to, to, to them to stimulate and, you know, maybe attract, you know, and, and help them uh, keep those thousand plus jobs here on the Guam. So on the marketing side, we do everything we can to make sure that their seats are full and they're working very closely together with them and their team. Uh, you can see the success between United Airlines, uh, GSEI, PIC, and Guam Visitors Bureau to grow the marathon and bring 2,000 2, people uh, internationally for that marathon. So we're very happy with uh, with, their, with them and their service and anything we can do to make them successful will ultimately Guam, Guam will be successful. So yeah, thank you and uh, maybe perhaps you and the GITA board can come up with some policies to really to help them in, a, in you know, what is a tough situation. I mentioned the yen, you know, they're up against that with the yen and you know, with globalization, you got to remember these airlines, these airplanes are mobile assets, not like a hotel, right? Um, <laughs> Mornaga-san can bring his, the Hyatt to, you know, Okinawa, right. but, you know, the airlines can bring that airplane somewhere else, right? So it's important that we make sure that they're successful so they can continue to fly. So great point, and I 100% I, I support that, and GVB would be willing to participate and give our ideas and support to any policy that you may design to help United. Okay, thank you. Um, you touched on in your awesome presentation with that super cute um, little girl <laughs> in the pool there. Tourism 2020 goals and, and your second Tourism 2020 goal is growing arrivals and you just um, increasing the diversity of the, of the market. So you, we talked a, a great deal about Japan and Korea, but I haven't really heard much from you about Taiwan, China, and even Russia. So I know that there are some visa, um, visa waiver issues and, and other things, but are we... We're not giving up on them, are we? Oh, no, absolutely not. I mean, we've been investing heavily and, you know, so, some criticism about the amount of money that we're allocating to China. But as I mentioned, you know, this part of Asia, you know, we're five hours away from three places, Korea, big source markets, Japan, and China, 200 million outbound from China. You know, there's, there's no two, two ways about it. Just look to our neighbors at the north in Saipan and what they're doing with, with uh, mainland China. So we need to be there. We need to... Uh, it is the future, so we need to continue to invest in China. And, you know, although the returns aren't happening right away, you know, this these is uh, future growth that we're investing into. Uh, Taiwan, as I mentioned, we did lose EVA Air. That's 40% of our seats, so we've got to be active with uh, China Air. And uh, that was kind of an internal, dis uh, they're making some changes at that airline. So, you know, it wasn't so much of the Guam service, but just a total reorganization of that airline. That So we're hoping to get incentivize them to come back, hopefully, um, China Airlines can go to daily. That would be a big win for us. As I mentioned, Hong Kong Express, uh, we do have United, so we're working closely with them in Hong Kong on, on more promotion. But we also want to look at other airlines like Hong Kong Express and we can work with them to bring them back. And then the last one is the Philippines. So as I mentioned, we have uh, sometimes twice daily from United. We have Philippine Airlines and Hong Kong Express. So I mean, and uh, uh, Cebu Pacific. So we have the opportunity, but you know we do have the restrictions with the visa. But with enough resources to market in those areas, you can see the growth we've had in the Philippines. We've basically doubled the amount of arrivals this past year, so we want to continue that trend going that way. So uh, that's why, you know, the more, you know, a big portion goes to the, the bigger markets, but the more resources we have, then we can spend more time and energy and uh, be more active in those, those kind of growth potential markets. You know, if the resources are tight, obviously we're going to cover the bases, focus on the, the Japan and Korea and try to do what we can in the other markets. So, that, you know, that's why we just ask that, you know, the more resources you give us, the more active we'll be and the more we can do. It's really an investment. It's that simple. Right. Yeah. And I just want to thank Pilar and her team for continuing the great work that they do in marketing our island. You um, you mentioned several times in your answers and in your, tes in your testimony um, family friendly, how you want to make sure that, you know, Guam is a, is a safe destination, that we want to market towards families. So I wanted to see if there's anything in particular that you're trying to do to make sure that we work with our stakeholders, our hotels, our, our airlines to make sure that we're really marketing towards families. 
I, I think that's a great point. I think we, mar we market towards families, but I think we can do more to be more family friendly, to be quite, uh, quite uh, honest with you that, uh, and kind of a future project, maybe we can work with the industry and stakeholders. I know when Jen um, uh, Chrysostomo Camacho was on our board, she was kind of planning towards, and she did have the uh, legislation passed for making breastfeeding uh, areas for mothers. Uh, so I think, I think there's a lot we can do to be more family friendly, and I thank you for that suggestion. Um, that's why I like to get away with, uh, you know, finish things like fixing the street lights, you know, like stage one of pick up trash and fix street lights, and then we can get creative and do what, you know, visitor bureau should be doing, initiatives to enhance the visit, direct visitor experience for our core markets. Basics of, you know, we don't want glass bottles on the beach and people step on it or people are getting uh, perch snatched, you know, and cover those bases and then we can go to and have lights in, on, on our streets and the next step is we can have, um, you know, uh, changing stations in the bathrooms, special lines for uh, expected mother or, or families, things like that. So I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you and we'll, I'll get together with the team and see if, you know, at least plant some seeds okay. to that regard because we are, that's how I mentioned for Japan, I feel very confident Guam is the best place. If you have a kid between zero and five, they want to come to Guam. You know, we see it at the shows coming with a stroller, and so we need to really shore that up. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you. For that comment. I have one, la I actually have a number of questions, but I'll just email you. Um, but one last one. Um, I chaired the Committee on Labor, and I would, I'm really glad to see programs like the Visitor Industry Professional Program. Could you tell us a little bit more about these programs as well as the additional programs that VSS provides? Uh, that, I mean, we, we have um, been more working together with GHRA and supporting their efforts on the workforce development side, but we wanted to create this, you know, one of our goals to improve our quality and our yield is to not just increase, you know, the hardware side, not just improve uh, hotel, um, the hotels and the rooms, but we have to improve the service side and the level of service. So the, the VIP program will provide, um, we're working on producing two minute videos, uh, everything dealing from cultural uh, sensitivity, um, uh, historical knowledge, also basic language skills that we would provide free on a website where our hotel uh, or our hospitality employees can go there and watch. Many of them are working one or even two jobs and don't have time to take classes at GCC. They could easily watch these uh, segments online and, and make it real accessible. The other thing is we can use that in, this, in the markets, translate it into Japanese, Korean, Chinese. So travel agents who might not be able to come to Guam can get the same training and learn how to say half a day and learn about our sites as well. So we're really excited to get this program. We're producing the videos now. Uh, next year's money will go towards launching the website. So we'll be excited to launch this new program next year. And then on the uh, workforce development, we continue to work with the Hero Awards, the, um, uh, to recognize our, our, uh, work, our hospitality employees for their outstanding, the Golden Maddie. So we work very closely with GAHRE and those, those programs. Thanks, Nate. This is Masu. Takamas. Half a day. Uh, could you tell me what GVB is tracking on its per visitor spend presently? Um, we, we, we track it per uh, Japan, but, but not, we don't have a total number. I mean, on average, we can give you the, it's about 1,100 is the average that each visitor spends, if you take that in totality. For, for a 3.5 day stay? And, uh, and where, I'm, where I'm going yeah. with this is, I, I recall that there used to be a, a general spend that visitors would make uh, during their visits to Guam, and that gave us a gauge of whether we had visitors who were bringing value to the island. You know, the ideal destinations always aspire, and I remember the board years ago uh, talking about working towards low volume but high value type customers. And that was with the intention that you're trying to preserve your culture and you're trying to preserve your environment. And so that you, know, the, you, you don't necessarily want to trample your, your, your place or flood yourself with um, visitors that, that have more of a wear and tear than, than an actual uh, long-term value economically, socially, culturally to the island. So that I'm, I'm just wondering, with with the with re 
there's reports consistently about how GBB is breaking the um, records by having record number from this market and from that market, but how does that translate into whether you're achieving or whether whether GBB has had, has met their long-term goal of of that quality type of visitor that most destinations aspire for? Yeah, thank you for that question, and, and that's why one of the slides I brought up was that that spend and something we track. Um, it, it's just a it's a little hard to put in just an overall number because we track the different markets individually. But for example. Uh, I think different ways you can see how our yield has gone up. As I mentioned, the average package price in Japan went from 70,000 yen, which is about $700, to 1,000. So uh, the spending, we track two numbers, prepaid spend. So this is what they spend, uh, you know, mainly that goes into airline and hotel. And then we have the on-island spend. So you would say like Japan, uh, so overall, I, I guess the way you can look at it is, you know, the tourist attraction fund has basically doubled since 2010. And our average daily rate at the hotels has gone from about, in 2010, it was about $130, and now we're close to $200. So, so, the, uh, so then, so then the, the, the target towards more L LCC uh, carriers, low-cost carriers, has not had an a, a adverse impact then on that. Because that's always what you worry yeah. about when you're, yeah. when you're driving it from that yeah. budget type thing. You would assume that you've got a... But yeah. that hasn't been the, the case then. Yeah, not, not necessarily. What we see is um, uh, we kind of we kind of had that same question, and we looked at the carriers we had coming out of Korea and the spend. We can look at the spend per carrier, and you couldn't say that the LCCs were uh, spending any less. They may be spending differently. So, for example, I think the biggest difference is I would say in Japan, uh, Japan and Korea, the on island spend is similar, but Japanese are staying one day less. So per day, Japanese spending is still up versus Korea. And then the way they spend, you would say, uh, if you go to, uh, if you go to Director Mesa's uh, Guam Premier Outlets, it's full of Koreans, so they love kind of sportswear, Tommy Hilfiger, and those kind of things. Where Japanese are still buying more of the luxury goods, so where Koreans maybe buying more things, but at a lower price. Where Japanese are spending kind of on maybe bigger, uh, more luxury items. So that's kind of the general. Uh, it's real general, but kind of the general. But I think spending is good, and, and you can see you can see the spend is up. Obviously, the largest spending, best spending uh, visitor markets to Guam are Russia and China. You know, they're spending the average on island spend for Japanese and Koreans, um, $440. The Chinese are uh, about 1500 and Russians, I think, about 1600 uh, for their, their spend. So, uh, yeah. So it balances either way, I, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you brought up something, and it, and it reminded me of, of a project a long time ago, the, um, the Holiday Illumination Project, which was geared towards Tumon. And you mentioned that, that because of the lights being fixed now, the light poles, were, we could see more of a presence. But has the, I noticed that the budget from when it, this project was first started is almost double. It, given that $232,000 is spent annually, um, first of all, is it is it two month centric, or are we spending this holiday illumination elsewhere? Uh, ju just for just for two. Just for two, two months. Month. So it's not spread to the the project in Aganya Heights, no. Uh, no, I think this is just two months. Okay, and then and then because the you would think that the life of the product that's put out there has more than than a two-month life, assuming the project is up for two months or just a little over two months. Is the, uh, is the inventory recycled so that GVB gets more uh, over the course of a year, or, or is this just basically a rental type thing where you contract with someone for that amount and the, uh, the lights or whatever inventory is there does not belong to GVB? So this is, this is really just a rental installation and dismantle fee? Uh, that, that's correct, ma'am. We, we do not, we just contract out for each uh, year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my original thinking, yeah, you could reuse the lights, but, you know, these are running 24, you know, or like, you know, running for a long time. So, and then storing it for a year, it just wasn't cost effective. It's, it's better just to do it each year. And then the lights, yeah, you would, they, after two months of straight, of using it, it doesn't last very long. And then, you know, try to power it up the next mm -hmm. year and Half of them work, half of them don't work. So we, did, we just do it on a contractual basis. Yeah. 
It might be it might be worth considering, uh, assuming it's just thrown in the dumpster. It might be worth considering having a um, a program where it can be recycled to the, at least the villages, which is you know uh, something that can, because you you figure the life of the product whether it's not it's not dead in two and a half months, even if it's running 24/7, which it isn't because it's a, it's an illumination project which only, which is only lit in the evening. Um, so I would think for that kind of incredibly high amount of this is incredible money um, for something that you're just throwing away. I would suggest that at the very least we can share the goodwill throughout the villages by giving it away or reusing it and cutting the cost by half because we did it the entire streets, all the streets and the medians for half of this years ago. So that's one, one area where Christmas cheer can certainly be spread a little bit further. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I will negotiate harder this year. I can help. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the GVB team. And, and personally, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Knight, for uh, all the efforts we've done to or work with you to establish the Sports Ambassador and Culture Ambassador Program. And you definitely have minimized the lines at the office. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, the, pro the program has been working really well, and I, and I thank you all for helping uh, our, our, our sports ambassadors and culture ambassadors to, to, to get out to these destinations that they need to. And creating this criteria has made it uh, easy for them to work with an application and to see if they can qualify to, uh, for the grant. So thank you. Um, we, you. You showed some pictures of these illegal dumps and there's abandoned vehicle. I know GVB uh, 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 working with some a donor provided surveillance or video security systems in Tuma. Are those are those there's particular on the roadside or they're not in these areas where you can? Yeah, yeah. We, we don't. We, it's mainly on San Torres. We we're talking to the. Uh, it was Docomo Pacific that provided those at no char uh, no charge uh, to the government. So we're looking at expanding that hopefully for the beach areas and some of the areas where we find a lot of the litter and. And that's a great idea, yeah. right? And you know, I, I bring that up because I know it's just an unfortunate uh, event, also that just took place uh, to Lovers Point. Um, I know uh, GPD's report showed that to a surveillance or video security system at the Payless Dedido Market, they were able to track these vehicles or or, or trace these vehicles and find these uh, apprehend these these, these two uh, individuals. Um, we've been working closely with one fire of the E911 system, um, and and also authorizing uh, their their authorizing the department uh, to expand in in using the E911 fund to to also uh, provide surveillance throughout our community, and 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 that's I hope you will work with one fire because. You know, Two Lovers Point, uh, City Bay Lookouts. These these are like soft area or soft target areas. I mean, and a lot of these criminals are going into these places because obviously there's there's a uh, e they're easy targets. I mean, yeah. I, I pass by City Bay every day, and I drive by there and see the tourists. And there's obviously you know a cop or a officer comes there probably once every three, four hours, and, you know, just on timing, you can easily, you know, take take for granted these tours that are, and there's been incidents there, so I, I hope uh, you can have some discussions with fire. They are in, um, in, in very close, my understanding this summer, to, to put out the procure, or sorry, the procurement process to expand the E911 fund. I get a whole new E911 system, and I hope GVB can partner uh, with them and seeing how, what, uh, Far we can go with video security systems, not just in Tumon, but yeah. areas that are, are, are where our visitors go, and ultimately protect our citizens, our people. So I, I hope you can work with uh, Chief Nicholas. They're they're moving pretty quick. Uh, I just hope when they start putting these things out that they'll keep you guys in mind and where we could where where we can actually put these video systems. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, Senator. Yeah, and thank you for working with us on that. Uh, I remember the senator coming to us uh, to GVB, working with my team, 
to come up with a solution for the off-island travel and you know although it, and I appreciate my team taking on the additional work to process these grants but you know when you see the little league baseball teams that you know have a little bit of support from their uh, government to go off island to to attend and really promote Guam it's really a joy to see and um, you know we thank the senator for coming to us working with us in collaboration and then getting it passed and now we're seeing the real results and yeah on the surveillance you know you can never have enough police president presence so I think using technology is a real cost-effective and smart way to uh, you know and the evidence it provides right in these kind of situations you can see around the world many of the crimes have been sold through visit uh, video surveillance so great great idea and we'll, uh, I'll give the chief a call and work closely with him on uh, procurement for a video surveillance system very very difficult so I'll work with him and give him our knowledge that we kind of went through it and it's kind of tough to do but we'll work together with him I, I, I appreciate that because uh, uh, you know we are at a point where we have to change kind of the course and how we, we can support law enforcement giving them the tools but also how we protect uh, or prevent these crimes from taking place. Uh, I mean, you know, we, to the credit of uh, even these visitors, start snapshotting these incidents to help law enforcement. But if we have a top of that, we cover this island. I'm sure it wouldn't be hard to surveil, surveil this entire island and tell these criminals that we're watching you reg regardless if uh, we don't have a warm body there in GPD. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. Do you, does GPB have any prior year obligations? No, sir. Just want to make sure. Okay, so we'll do. I want to thank all of you for all that you have done over the. <clears throat> for a long time now. <laughs> so uh, I see some of you out there uh, that had GBB. Uh, and so uh, if I have any questions, I'll send it to you. Uh, I, I think I've gotten most of the answers uh, that, that I needed. And your oversight chair and I are discussing some other things that we need to do. Um, and so... Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for your very successful year. And uh, though I have problems trying to figure out why five million is necessary to stand still um, or stay status quo, uh, we'll we'll look at the, at the request and uh, see how things go. With that, we are in recess until. 10 a.m. on Tuesday to meet with the Department of Administration. Thank you. Thank you very much.